Okay, so we started recording, thank you. And um, so again, I'm Gavin Fulmer and uh, co-chair of the NARS International Committee. Thank you everyone for coming. And um, without further ado, I want to pass it on to the, the organizers for the, the session who, who helped uh, conceive of the topic and, and invite speakers. And so I'll, I'll pass it off. Thank you so much, Gavin, for the introduction. Um, so my name is Irini Primiotu, and I'm a postdoctorate uh, researcher at the University of Cyprus. Uh, thank you all for attending this event today. Um, this session will focus on working and researching abroad, meaning outside one's home country. And this event was organized by uh, Lucia, by Erin and myself. Hey, Lucia. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> so I'm Lucia uh, from University of La Coruña in Spain. And before uh, moving on to our presentations for today, uh, we would like to share some information with you from uh, youth participants uh, according to what you did in the registration form. So Irene, if you could move forward. Okay, so it looks like we are from everywhere in the world, which is really nice. Thank you very much. So we have people from, like from uh, Australia and South Korea to India to Canada, the US, Colombia, Nigeria, and also like different parts in Europe and Middle East, like Lebanon or Netherlands. So thank you very much for being here, for making this like really international. And also, it's not just that we are worldwide, but we are from very different strands of education. So from graduate students to emeritus professors, uh, and also including, of course, teachers and educators from different fields and uh, um, education uh, steps. OK, so thank you very much again for being here. And Irini, to you again. Thank you, Lucia. So uh, for um, this event, we uh, on your registration form, we had uh, three, question, three questions. So the first question was for this event, which form or forms of research experience abroad interest you? So two responses related to uh, a research experience as, as part of a PhD studies. Um, Nine people were interested in finding uh, more about doing a research experiences as part of a temporary work, and six people as part of a permanent work. And then the second question related to the motivations for or desired benefits from a research experience approach, and the answers related to, um, the, here's a summary of the answers actually. Um, so people were interested in doing a research experience abroad to broaden research and teaching collaborations, to upgrade research skills, to enhance background knowledge, uh, learn different academic cultures and contribute to the research community. However, there were some obstacles noted that might discourage people from pursuing a research experience abroad and this of course, concern the financial cost, the need for funding, family ties, and the lack of a well-established network at an international level. So um, we are pleased to be joined for this session by three speakers who will share insights from their international experiences in science education. Uh, first, uh, we, uh, we begin with Dr. Petzabe Torres Olave. Then we will continue with Dr. Lee Kenneth Jones and then with Dr. Kong Sing Tang. So please uh, feel free to um, write your questions on the chat box uh, during the uh, speakers' presentations and we will address all of them at the end of uh, the presentations. So Betame, the floor is yours. Okay, can you see my screen and also listen to me properly? Yes. Good. Okay, so uh, also I'm gonna measure my time so I'm not going over. Uh, 
So hello everyone, uh, my name is Betsabe Torres Olave. I'm from Chile and I'm gonna share a little bit about going being abroad, uh, particularly in my cases in the UK and also other places. Um, I'm gonna divide my presentation into first who I am, uh, like being abroad, how did I manage to achieve it, uh, what opportunities did I have during my PhD, some main challenge and also some advice based on my learning experience. Uh, between these, these spaces. So first of all, who I am, I'm Betsabe, my pronouns are uh, she, her, I'm from Chile, South America. Uh, and I'm saying that because sometimes here people don't know where Chile is. So, so you, you know it's a country in South America. Uh, I, sorry. Oh, I don't know what it is, it's not working. Ah, no. I'm from Valparaíso. It's a city that is around two hours from the capital of the country. And I think that is one of the maybe best cities in the world, uh, but that's a really biased uh, view, of course. And I've always been really involved in the political uh, things as a teacher, like as a former school teacher, teacher educator, as a student as well. Um, I'm still uh, like really involved into, into like justice in all its forms. And I study pedagogy and physics in Chile. Uh, as you can see, a very male dominated field. So I was one of the few women in the Faculty of Physics. And uh, even though like that was uh, an issue that was, of course, like a challenge, I still had like really good mentors and good friends. But I put some photos of like people who kind of like influenced me a little bit. And maybe this guy that is there, like the old guy, it's really the only one that I was like kind of like, that I could feel that I could talk to and ask things to. So maybe this is the first person that I met that had a PhD. Uh, because I come from a family, a working class family, so no one went to university. My parents didn't finish the school, so there was a lot of information that I I didn't have as uh, like when I was like at the school and then at the university as well. I needed to like being always asking, uh, so I kind of developed maybe the skill of like being a good asker. I'm always asking things, um, and in 2016 I decided to go abroad for one year. Uh, that's me in my spaceship going abroad. Uh, so first I decided to go abroad for one year only, like for a master uh, only. And then uh, I want to share now a little bit of how did I decide to study abroad, what to study, where to study as well. So as I said before, I was quite limited because I didn't have a lot of information on who to ask in my family, for example, at the university and the physics faculty, uh, they didn't give us too much information. Uh, about things that were available for us. And I met this guy there, and also this person who was my partner back then. Um, and this, we were like the TAs of this guy, and he invited us to, to like be work, working with him. And he kind of encouraged us to do some postgrad studies in Chile. So we went to Santiago in the capital of the country, where usually you have more information in the capital of countries. So we knew a little bit of, and more about that. But then after a few years working as a school teacher and a teacher educator, I met some other people uh, because there were a group of people at the university in Valparaíso who were very into like, how can we bridge uh, the space of the university with the school? Uh, so they contacted me because I was a school teacher, um, like in a secondary school in Valparaíso in Chile, and they decided to start working with me. And I met this woman that is there in this photo, uh, Paulina Bravo, who is one of my collaborators now, actually. And we work together a lot. And she's also my friend. And she got a, um, a scholarship to study abroad uh, in the UK to do a PhD in 2015. And if it wasn't because of her, I wouldn't know that a PhD was something that you could apply to. And that's something that you could apply to and have a scholarship from the government that they would pay for you. I didn't know that that was a thing. Uh, so she was quite nice because she not, she just shared her like application process, her entire process for applying to university to do a scholarship, but also she made me to feel that it was an easy thing to do, that it wasn't too complicated. So because of that, I decided to apply for uh, a master first, and I went to the UK. So the first thing that I would say as advice is that having people to get inspired by it and having people to ask for help is key because otherwise you wouldn't have information about, uh, or you wouldn't have anyone to ask for uh, things that for some people seems maybe like obvious, but not for everyone. And for some people that you don't have anyone around you that has conducted a PhD or a master in another country. Uh, so then I did a master in the UK and I met this guy that in uh, 2017, he's Justin Dillon, he worked in science education and he was my, my master supervisor. And he asked me like, why don't you do a PhD? 
and I was like, oh, maybe I could do a PhD. And also someone believed that I can do a PhD. So that was like another kind of like encouragement by someone else, which has to do with my uh, second advice. So mentors are essential. So you need to get a good one and also be a good one if you happen to be a mentor at some point. Uh, and, and, and one question that I, people sometimes ask me, how can you decide who is gonna be a, a good mentor? And for me it was really important that when I was like kind of like deciding where to study my master first, so before coming to another country, to another continent, I emailed a lot of people as potential supervisors. And a lot of people, they never answered to me, which has to do with a lot of things, not necessarily because I don't want, it could be also because maybe they have like, a lot of like things to do and tasks to do at the university. We said a little bit about the academic culture in those spaces as well. Uh, but Justin answered to me really quickly. Also, at some point he went to Chile when I was taking the decision. And for me, that was really important because it was okay, this person really cares about knowing other cultures and going to other places, like going out of the UK in his case to see other continents like Chile. Uh, so that's how I decided that he would be a good mentor uh, for me because it was kind of open to other cultures and also like a quick, a quick answer in emails. And something that I had to do to like kind of apply for both my master and my PhD was a lot of applications. So a government scholarship, to different universities, which in the UK is not too difficult when you have good marks in your undergrad, like it's easy to get access and to get like accepted by universities. And so they, all, they, they quite value this issue of like, um, maybe you don't have a research background, but if you work as a school teacher or a teacher educator, that kind of like counts as a previous experience. So that's good. Uh, also like applying for a visa uh, to a bank, accommodation, like a lot of things, a lot of applications, which for me was just like more, more like asking people who were in those countries, like email random people, something that I didn't know, uh, searching like on Facebook, it was some like group of Chilean people living abroad, Chilean people living in the UK in that particular case, uh, traveling through Google Maps and just seeing the city to see like, okay, is this a city for me or not? Uh, also, I had, to pass, I had to take the English test and I couldn't pass until my third attempt, which was also like a lot of things over me because I just couldn't do it. So also like kind of like, how, how can I pass this? How can I pay for this again? Because you have to pay for it. Uh, and experience another culture. So a language uh, issue because um, my English was not good at all. I'm still learning, of course, but back then I couldn't even speak. As you can see, I had to take the test three times. So that was a big uh, issue for me. But when I arrived, I had a lot of support by other people. So for example, my supervisor, he, I don't know how he was managing, but he was just trying to communicate with me, inviting me to go to museums, for example, so I could just kind of like experience the, 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 the entire British kind of culture. Uh, also the food, because we eat different things, right? So that was also a challenge for me. Like I was missing avocado a lot, like avocados in the UK are horrible and in Chile are really tasty. So I was suffering a lot. And so you have different rights because as an international student as, and as a non-British person, you are not entitled to a lot of things. So that's, that's a big, that was a big issue for me to like kind of understand what are my rights in this country. Uh, and there's a ways of relating. So for example, in South America, we tend to be quite friendly. We can help people a lot and in the UK they don't. So for me, that was also kind of a challenge, like how to learn, relearn, or maybe make friends that are okay with me having them and being friendly. Uh, and also learn to walk in the other side of the road because they do everything in the other side of the road, which was a big challenge. Like literally, I didn't know where to look at when I was like walking in the street, like should I look at this side or this side? So crossing the road was a big uh, issue for me. And some of the main opportunities, so maybe like the most important ones that I remember and that kind of meant a lot for me for what I'm doing now, uh, were uh, three experiences that I'm gonna share about now. And it has to do with three key issues. So my mentor, as I have been sharing, uh, the ESERA community as well, that uh, I met really important people through ESERA. And also that I think that I'm really good at writing emails. Uh, so when you are good at writing emails, you can reach people out and, and just like kind of like, just put yourself there and I'm just gonna send this email. And luck, of course, because it has to do with luck as well. It's not that you don't deserve things sometimes, it's just, just being lucky or not. Uh, so I went to the summer school in Esera, to the conference in Esera, and also I got an Esera uh, travel award. 
so the first thing that I did was uh, I went to the Sera Summer School in 2018 in Crete, where I actually met uh, Irini. Uh, so that was nice. And I met a lot of other people that are still my kind of academic friends and other some like personal friends as well. You had to apply for that one like a year in advance. And I only knew about this because my mentor told me that was a thing that it was there and you could apply. And it was it is really nice that Ezera has the summer school and then you have the conference. So when you go to the conference, you are not alone because you see all the friends that you met in the in the summer school. Uh, and then I also uh, applied to the travel award that I knew about this because I didn't know that was a thing in the summer school because, because someone uh, got it. So she shared with me, oh, this is a thing that exists. Then I asked my mentor, like, is it something that I can apply to? And he said, yes. So then I, I contact a potential uh, mentor and she was, uh, yes, of course, let's do this. So that was really good. I first failed, I didn't get it, but then I tried again uh, and I got it. Uh, so I didn't know that you could apply again, for example. And because my mentors told me, yes, you can, I did. So I went to Groningen to visit uh, Lucia Bremidou and her research team. Uh, they are very friendly people. I wrote a little bit about the experience. If you go to the page of Esera, you can read a little bit about what I did there. Uh, but uh, some, some main things that I would like to see is like many opportunities for me were like connecting with a mentor working in my field. So someone that I was literally using all of her work in my, in my PhD thesis, like I was quoting her everywhere. And it was amazing to share my, my thesis, my PhD like thesis with her and with her team. Uh, so presenting my work also to an audience closer to my theme. So people who were more engaged with what I was doing. Uh, and also learning another academic culture. Ah, uh, me too. <laughs> and the entire section. <laughs> and learning another academic culture, like seeing how it is to be like a science educator researchers in another place, so not just in the UK, but also in this case in in Groningen, uh, in the ISEC team. I could talk like in informal places, so just walking around the university, and also in more formal places. Uh, and I think the main challenge for me. Uh, from this was living because I didn't want to live because I was having a really good time like just thinking with other people just seeing other people as well like that was very like it's, it's really nice to write in a dissertation and seeing the person that you're quoting just there uh, so because of that I went again there uh, a lot of times and actually like uh, Dagmar and Natalia they trained me for your job interviews and because of them the help of them as well I have a job now because they train me to do that uh, so some key things about uh, your PhD, you need to have a good mentor who informs you of things available for you. You need to be a, a student who asks things, but sometimes you don't know what to ask. So some questions could be like, where could I go? What could I do? How could I pay for it? Am I allowed to apply for this? Because sometimes you think that you are not allowed to, but then if you ask, you learn that, oh, maybe I am allowed to, or there are some ways of still doing it. And also uh, connect with and reach other people to read applications uh, with, to write together to, for support from friendship as well, because your friends are usually in your home country and you need to create new ties in these new spaces. So the main challenge for me was like finding some funding for going to all these places. And the university in the UK, they have internal funding, but international students cannot apply. And, and it says like that you cannot apply. However, I had another mentor in Bristol that she was always telling me like, maybe you cannot, but we can make a case for you why you, you should be entitled to apply. So try to always still ask, even if it's, if it's said that you can't, still try to talk to someone who we're making support with that. And also I'm lucky enough that my passport give me easy access to other regional contexts, but that's not the case for everyone. So the Chilean person, for example, I can be in the UK with my student visa and I can go to Europe and to the summer school, to the conference, to Groningen, without an issue because I don't need a, pass, a, a visa for that. But that's not the case for everyone. And, and that's something that we always need to like bear in mind. And it has to do also with risk. So I'm sharing here a phrase from Simon Bell, one of my favorite philosophers. So she said that risk is an essential need of the soul. The absence of risk produces a type of boredom which paralyzed in a different way from fear. So you need to just risk yourself, write that email, ask people things. Uh, and to finish, uh, apart from the thing that I said, I think that we need to always bear in mind that not all the students have the same experiences because we have the restrictions of move based on our passport and restrictions to apply for funding. So the people who open positions for people to work or for a postdoc or for a PhD needs to consider that. Also mentors, how to support your PhD student, how to ask them like, and also find out who to, to reach to ask these kind of things. 
And also there are a lot of things out there that you don't know. And the only way you can know is by asking and, and blog as well. So try to be someone that people can ask things uh, because it's good to have someone that you, you can actually like, ask things to. And I can be someone that you can ask things if you want. So that is my email and you can ask me things either now or afterwards if you want. Thank you so much, Betsambe. That was a very authentic uh, presentation. Thank you so much. So we move on to Lee Jones. Hello, everyone. One second. All right. I'm hoping you can see my screen and you can hear my voice. Uh, I'm coming at this from a little different angle. So I am a current teacher, uh, classroom teacher. So I'll talk a little bit about teaching abroad and kind of how I got abroad and my experiences um, being in Korea. So a bit of background information about me. Um, you can see my education experience there. My current role is I work as an elementary makerspace coordinator and integrationist. And so I work with TK3, so three-year-olds all the way up to fifth grade. Um, I run and coordinate the makerspace, all the equipment, and I find ways to both train students, skill students, and then also um, work with the classroom teachers and fit the makerspace into their curriculum. So it's an exciting job. It's been fun. Um, my background, though. So before coming abroad, I worked in uh, Oregon in the USA for nine years. I was a high school science teacher and I taught some STEM courses um, there. And then in 2017, we decided to move abroad. And so we came to Korea. We started out in a small suburb of Seoul, the northeast corner of Seoul, um, called Noangu. I was there for four years um, at one international school. And then more recently, uh, two years ago, uh, this is my second year now, we moved to Jeju, which is that island here off the southern coast of Korea. It's a Korean island. Um, it's a vacation destination for a lot of, a lot of Korea. They call it the Hawaii of Korea. Um, so it's nice. It's a nice little beach area. Okay, a bit about my school. Um, I work at St. Johnsbury Academy in Jeju. I'm here with my family. I have um, three kids now. You can see two of them there in that picture. The third one just came about two weeks ago. So he's in that picture. You just can't quite see him. Um, it's a picture of a beach. So just kind of our, our backyard. A, a wonderful spot. Uh, the school itself is about 1,100 students. It ranges from PK3 all the way up to 12th grade. So it's all seniors at 18, 19. It's broken apart into three schools, so elementary, middle, and high school. Um, but they're all in the same location, so all on the same campus. So we do a lot of vertical alignment and working between those different levels. We also have boarding for both the middle school and high school students. So there's a number of students that live up on the mainland of Korea, but then they board during the week and then maybe go home on the weekends or just during breaks. And being in this large school, we have about 175 total teachers, um, both classroom and assistant teachers in the mix. Okay, how I got here. So my experience is definitely different than what most people is for getting overseas. In fact, the process that I followed, I wouldn't recommend. I'll give you kind of a better process if it interests you later on. But um, in 2015, I started my doctoral program, kind of my personal or my, my long-term goal. I'd like to work in a school with pre-service teachers or in-service teachers, be in a, a university clinical position or in a uh, uh, research institute of some sort. Uh, just working with pre-service and in-service teachers. So I entered the doctoral program with that in mind. In the program, I had a classmate who was working as an international teacher in Japan. And so I got to talking to him and it sounded really interesting. And so I started doing some research. I was talking to my wife at the time about changing schools. And at that time we were just thinking about going to a different school in Oregon, but we decided to maybe look into teaching overseas. So um, 2015, my daughter had just been born. We had a son on the way. And so I definitely researched countries that were suitable for families, especially young kids. And Korea came out at the, the top of the list of places to go. And so I did the digital equivalent of cold calls, where I just literally Googled international schools in Korea, um, bookmarked a bunch of them that I found interesting. And then I just wrote resumes and cover letters. And I sent it to all those different schools. I only heard back from one. It's not the typical process, but the school, uh, they got in contact with me. I had an interview via Skype. They sent me a contract that weekend. I signed it, I had a job, and then I ended up moving here. So a bit about international teaching just in general. Um, the name international, sometimes they're called foreign schools. 
Um, the name might give you uh, visions of a school full of students from all around the world. But that's typically not the case. That name, International Foreign School, is because it's a school that's um, owned or run or teaches a, a foreign curriculum. And so in the case of most of them, they're usually U.S., Canada, or British-style curriculums in a, a foreign country. And so St. Johnsbury Academy is actually a school in Vermont in the U.S., and we are the sister school in um, Jeju. But 99% of my students are going to be Koreans from Korea. We have a handful of sporting students from China. Other than that, any of the other like foreign students are going to be staff kids that live there. However, even though it might just be U.S., Canada, or British-style curriculum, the teachers typically come from all around. You'll find a wide range of teachers from different locations in the 175. So we don't just all come from um, North America or, or Britain. Britain. Um, the benefits, so they vary from school to school, but typically I get my housing covered. So um, I have an apartment here on campus. Um, I get flights home for me and my family during the summer. My tuition is covered for my two uh, school-age children to attend to my school, um, health care, and then competitive salary, especially when compared to teaching in the U.S. It's a very competitive salary. All right, so the typical route. This is what most other teachers do, not what I did, but I told you about a couple slides back. Um, the typical route is to sign up through the service. So these services are, are placement agencies um, that work with both the schools and teachers to help find um, post different jobs. Um, so you sign up through one of those services. Jobs are typically posted in November. So international schools work on a very, very early calendar. In fact, I just got my um, contract for next year today. And so we start signing our contracts in October. That way that schools can post jobs in November. They can snatch up the best teachers quickly and they can go through all the process of getting in here. And so it's a, a different schedule in that sense. Um, but typically then starting in November, you start applying and interviewing. There's job fairs that you can attend. You sign a contract, you do a lot of visa paperwork. Um, schools do a good job of helping you with that. And so you're not left alone. The process there is a lot easier. And eventually you just move. Um, I know a lot of people here are probably researchers and so not looking to go back to teaching at a, a K through 12 school, but something um, worth noting that might be of interest to a lot of researchers is the idea of working with international schools. And so something to note about international schools is you have a consolidated population of English speaking students of a foreign ethnicity or, or from a foreign location. And so one of the challenges when you're doing research is uh, with a, a global, um, global study is you have to then translate, you have to get um, verified and everything else that goes into that process because of all the different languages that are spoken. But you do have that opportunity then if you work at the international school to have those students from those countries, but know that they come from an academically uh, or an English speaking academic situation. And so it gives the opportunity to do research. During my doctoral program, we did a um, draw a scientist test, a DAST, with students from five different countries. And we did it through the international school. So we had the opportunity to um, hit students who spoke English, didn't have to go through the process of doing the translations. Also, um, most international schools are longitudinal. And so it's not just an elementary, middle, and high school, but you have all three of those in one location. And so the same thing when I was able to do that study, those international schools reached, I got students from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade and was able to collect those samples all in one setting. And so that's just a, an interesting aspect that most people think about when they think about um, global studies. Okay, so the good and the bad of working internationally. So the good parts, first off, salary and benefits, especially coming from the US, they're great. Next thing is you have the opportunity to experience a new country, new food, you have the opportunity to learn a new language. My Korean is not great. I can get through a restaurant, but it's not as good as it should be after six years living here. Um, you also have the opportunity to work with teachers from all around the world. And so not teachers who just went to the same universities and same schools as you, but teachers who are trained from all over and have traveled to different countries and are now bringing their expertise to the location where you are. You also have the chance to work with learners in a different setting. You know, when I went through my teacher training program, it was all within the, the Western context. But now that I'm here in Korea, like I'm learning how the Korean students think, how their culture impacts the way they learn. And it's really caused me to kind of uh, you know, expand the way that I teach and reach out to students. You also have the chance to travel and uh, move frequently. So there's a, a cohort of teachers who 
will just go to an international school, be there for two, three years, and then go to another one just so they can see different countries and experience different places. The challenges. So first off, obviously communication. Um, I don't speak Korean, but my parents, my students and my community, they largely, they're, they're all Korean. And so Korean is their native tongue. And so it's hard for me sometimes to communicate, especially with parents who don't speak any English. You have to go through translation. Um, my students, you know, even though they, they are, um, they speak English at the school, it's not their native tongue. And so sometimes there's a little bit of difficulty communicating, connecting with those students and same thing with the community at large. That's very different from being in the US where I was surrounded by English speaking people from the same culture and background as me. Also the difference in learning uh, approaches between the different countries and cultures. You know, the, the Western style curriculum is very different from what a, a student might experience in a Korean public school. And so there's different expectations then for you know me when I moved here, but then also the students when they come to an international school, uh, what they expect. And so that's that's a whole long conversation, but that is a challenge. Um, the idea of teachers moving all the time, it, it causes a constant revolving door of new coworkers and admin. So some years when I walk in, it's almost a, I don't recognize anybody. And so it just makes it a challenge to, to always readjust every year, learn a new flow of things. It's not, it's not uncommon for you to have a 50% turnover in a school. It doesn't mean it's a bad school, it's just the, the nature of the beast. And also, um, most of the schools, they lack economic diversity. These are international private schools, and so students pay tuition, and it's 20, 30, 40, $50,000 of tuition. And so it's mostly going to be your, your upper echelon of um, economically advantaged people or students that go to these schools. The pay and the benefits are inversely proportional to the desirability of the location. So if you want to teach overseas and you've got an awesome location in mind, a uh, beautiful location, uh, it, it typically is then going to mean your pay and benefits go down. The pay and benefits are just to get teachers to come to lo locations that are maybe less desirable. And then, of course, the distance from friends and family. You know, we're in Korea. My family is all in the U.S. And so just the challenge of that distance, especially during COVID times, when traveling back home wasn't easy um, or possible at times. All right. Um, so that kind of reaches the end. I flew through that a little quick. Uh, but if you have other questions, this is my email address, whether it be talking about research collaborations, working with international schools. Um, in the past, I've given this talk in larger form question and answer to in-service and pre-service teachers who are thinking about going international. If you work with that kind of community, I, I'm happy to set up a time to talk to them as well, or just general question and answer as well. But that's all for me. Okay, thank you very much, Lee. Uh, so maybe we can now move to Dr. Boxing. I know you see my slides and hear me well. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Right. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here uh, to talk about a topic that really uh, matters a lot to me, which is being an international uh, migrants and researchers. Uh, and, and it's really good to see so many of you from all over the world, uh, such a, a diverse cast of uh, science education researchers. Uh, so so my, my, my talk will be sort of focusing on uh, living and working in Australia. Uh, by the way, I'm an associate professor at Curtin University. So I guess I'm sort of speaking at uh, so from an academic uh, point of view, what, what is it like to uh, work in Australia? So uh, in case you have not heard of of, uh, and want to know what it looks like. Uh, so here's a, a picture of our beautiful city. Uh, so, so this is a picture that's taken from my drone uh, at 4 a.m. in the morning in the summer. Uh, so, so this is Perth City. Um, so Perth is um, the state capital of uh, Western Australia. Uh, it has a population of around uh, two, 2 million people. Uh, Perth has the reputation of being one of the most isolated uh, cities in the world because the, the closest uh, city with another 1 million population will be Adelaide, and that's about two-thirds the length of the uh, United States. So you can see we're, we're pretty far from uh, in all our other places. And if you look at the map, uh, sort of we, are, we have the Indian Ocean on the west side and a desert, uh, which is the Western Australia is pretty much uh, a desert uh, on the eastern side. So, so we're 
you know, it's good to be in, in, a, in a very isolated city. Um, and I should mention that Perth is uh, uh, ranked as the six most livable cities in 2021, according to the EIU. Uh, and, and, and this is important for my reason of going there. Uh, in 2022, I think it was not in the top 10, but I, I suppose that's because of COVID. Uh, so Australia closed its border to the rest of the world. So I guess that's why we're not in the top 10, but it is a pretty uh, good place to live here. So a bit about my, my background. Uh, so I, I was born and raised in uh, Singapore and I did my K-12 education there. Uh, after finishing my high school, I went to the uh, University of Cambridge in the UK to study um, my bachelor and my master's in physics. Uh, and this is a picture of uh, uh, Cambridge. If, if there is one of the most beautiful places on earth, uh, still is, uh, after being to many places, it's sort of my favorite place to go. Uh, then I came back to Singapore to work as a physics teacher for, um, or not just a physics teacher, but also in various capacity for a total about 7.5 years. And after that, I decided to pursue a PhD. And at the time, I decided to go to the US instead of the UK, uh, partly to get a taste of the American education system uh, and, and, and just to you know, see for myself what is it like over there. And, I, and I'm happy to make that decision because I think that the US, uh, if some of you have studied there, provides a very uh, broad base and strong foundation. Uh, it has a very rigorous two to three years of coursework, which many places like Australia and UK doesn't have. So it's longer, but it, it provides you with that very rigorous training. Uh, and I, I chose Michigan because uh, I was inspired by uh, J.M. Key, who is very well known in, from his book, Talking Science. So I went to learn from him on uh, a classroom discourse, and that's why I chose Michigan. Um, and here's a picture of University of Michigan. Um, so I, I was there um, yeah, for four years, and then I came back uh, to Singapore again, uh, and now I work as the um, uh, assistant professor at the Nanyang Technological University uh, for another five years. Uh, then, for reasons that I'll explain later, I decided to make a move. Uh, that's my big move to, to Australia. And I currently, currently work at Curtin University for six years and plus, and I'm still working here. I have no plans to move around uh, yet. <laughs> so as you can see, I, I've sort of traveled quite a bit around the world. I've lived in four countries in four different continents, uh, and it's really given me a very rich, diverse experience uh, uh, and having a taste of different cultures and, and living environment. Uh, just, just in case you have a question about where to get my funding from, to, I, I wasn't in, born in a rich family, uh, but all, I was privileged enough to have scholarships from both of my uh, bachelor's and also for my PhD to study in the UK and the US. Uh, just to continue a bit further, so uh, I'm currently um, a Singapore citizen. Uh, I, at this point, I can actually apply for Australian citizenship, uh, but because Singapore does not allow for dual citizens, so if I have, if I apply for Australian citizen, then I have to give up my uh, Singapore passport. So that's not something I will be doing uh, at this point. Maybe in the future, I may consider switching my citizenship after a few more years here. Uh, but I'm currently an Australian permanent resident. Uh, and again, I will say more about how the, the process of getting that. Uh, I have a, a wife uh, and a teenage daughter. And by the way, my, my daughter was born when I was doing my PhD in, in Michigan. Uh, so she, she's a bit like me. She has traveled with me across three different countries in the US and Singapore and Australia. Uh, and maybe when she grew up, I will probably want her to go to UK to study, <laughs> to, to just have the same experience that I have. Um, uh, the, the last point is not really relevant for my talk, but I guess I should mention that my research interest is in uh, science classroom discourse, uh, language and literacy in science, and uh, multimodality or multiple representations. Uh, just in case if any one of you are working in that area, maybe we could contact and talk more about those research topics uh, elsewhere. Uh, okay, so one of the questions that many people will ask me is why did I, why did I choose to come to Australia? Uh, so there isn't one singular factor that made me move to here. I guess there's a combination of many different contributing factors. Uh, one of the big things will be the living environment. And, and that's why I mentioned about the, uh, the ranking of the six most livable cities. So Perth is a very nice place to live. Uh, it has a great outdoor, it's perfect weather, uh, vibrant culture, a multicultural society, and, and all the plus things. Um, so, so that's one of the good 
one of the reasons why I decided to move here. I have to say that Singapore is not a bad place to live itself. Uh, you know, Singapore is a very vibrant economy, uh, and and it's a, if, if you like cities, you know that that's really uh, there's a lot of energy in in that city, and it's also a very safe and clean uh, environment. So so many people love Singapore as well, and I do love Singapore too. Uh, but I, I suppose Singapore is too crowded. It it is uh, uh it 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 is 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 a is 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 an island state uh, with six million people living there. Uh, compared to in Australia, we have 22 million people. So you can imagine about one quarter of all Australians squeezing into an island that is smaller than New York City. So you can imagine that's quite pretty crowded. Uh, and compared to Australia, we have a lot more open spaces. Uh, and, and the other thing is also the work-life balance in Australia is uh, wonderful um, uh, for, for, I guess for me, work is not just the main thing. And I suppose, you know, no matter how great is our research and we're so passionate in our work, we have to remember that this is only part of our life. Uh, and, and, and I guess work-life balance is quite a big thing. And uh, as Australia is quite well known for uh, their, their work-life balance here. Uh, and just like Lee Jones, I guess I have family, and that's also important considerations. And Perth uh, is, is a good place to uh, uh, raise a family with uh, young kids, uh, with, with them uh, sort of a good childhood for, for them to, to raise a family. Uh, I suppose the last reason is sort of my sense of adventure and wanderlust. Uh, so as you can see, my background, I've been traveling around the places. And uh, so I love to live in the new places, uh, have a different feel of different culture and, and learn new things, meet more people and so on. So I guess all these reasons are why I decided to move to Australia. Uh, there are other circumstantial reasons as well. So uh, I was working, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, as an assistant professor at the National Institute of Education. Uh, one thing about uh, uh, Singapore is that there is only one teacher college in Singapore, uh, which is called the National Institute of Education. Uh, so you can imagine it's, it's a very big institution with, uh, it's almost like the 10 times the size of a typical teacher's college. Uh, so being the only teacher's college uh, in, in, in there, uh, if you're not really happy with the environment, there's no other places you can go within the country. Uh, you, you know, unlike in America, if you're not happy with New York City, for instance, you can move to another city or New York itself has many other universities. Uh, just like in Perth, we have four universities that have school education. Uh, but, but in Singapore, there's only one place. Uh, so I was not very happy uh, in, in, in NIE for for reasons that I will not disclose here. Uh, so to, to make a move, you basically have to move to another country. So that's part of the reasons why. Uh, so in, in 2015, I saw an open uh, advertisement uh, advertising for senior lecturer uh, at, at Curtin. Uh, maybe just a bit of context. In, 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 in Australia, it's unlike the US where you have sort of a three tier ranking, uh, uh, ranks of assistant associate and full professor. In, in Australia, there is five tier. Uh, so the senior lecturer is actually the mid here, uh, which is kind of equivalent to an early associate professor level. Uh, and whereas associate professor in Australia is sort of like a lead to early full professor level. So, so it's a different uh, tier. Uh, so, so when I saw the position, it is sort of well, in, in some ways a promotion as well. Uh, so I decided to apply for the job and I, I got the job in 2016. I have to say that uh, prior to my applications, I do not have any uh, previous experience of working in Australia or, or any contact uh, that I know of people at Curtin. But I, I do know some uh, acquaintance uh, and, and brief contacts, but not sort of close collaborators or mentors that I have over here. Uh, so so my, my sort of, um, the way I get in here is, I would say it's solely based on, on the CV. Uh, when I talk to a lot of people in Australia, they, they will often talk says that uh, it is quite important to get local experience uh, in many professions, like um, even as a doctor, a teacher, a lawyer, uh, you know, ha having a good experience from overseas um, will only get you half halfway there, and and many of them do require some sort of local experience. Uh, but I guess for us in this, uh, we are working in academia. Uh, our profession is a bit more international in that sense. Um, or, or maybe I should say that our, our job we have two sides to it: the teaching side and the research side. Uh, for teaching, as as far as teaching is concerned, it is they are perhaps more localized. Uh, so your your um, the 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 teaching um, in, in different country met. Do 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 have matters a bit, uh, so so uh, if if it's basically based on my teaching experience, I probably will not get the job at Curtin because I've never taught in Australia before uh, in in the in the uh, universities. But because we are also uh, half of our job is also doing research, and uh, research is sort of more of a global enterprise, if you may. Uh, if you think about publications, uh, uh, you know your your publications in in well, in the international journals, right? 
uh, GRST or science education uh, is, is sort of but highly mobile. So uh, I guess if on hindsight, well, why, why I got the job is because I have uh, a number of um, uh, publications in those journals. And when I talk to my friends now at Curtin about uh, who was in the search committee, I guess uh, that was part of the reason why I was um, I got the job. So I guess my advice here is, is for people inspiring to sort of move overseas to, to get a job. I guess research will be, um, you know, back to the old saying, publish of publish or perish. Uh, so it's quite true that, um, you know, as long as you have good publication record, um, th these are international. So, so it doesn't matter if you're moving from one country to another, uh, this is what they'll be looking at. Um, so just to share some challenges and, and maybe some advice, uh, I guess for me to transition to Australia was relatively easy. Uh, I'm speaking in terms of cultural, uh, linguistically, or even financially and logistically. Uh, so, so financially, of course, the university um, um, uh, pay for my move to here. Uh, culturally speaking, it wasn't that tough for me as well, because partly because of my overseas experience. And, and it's not very, the cult culturally speaking, Singapore and Australia are pretty, not, not that, different, uh, we, more, all of us speak English uh, and, and I don't have to learn a new language unlike some of our speakers. So there, I don't have much of uh, issues with the transition. Uh, but I will say one thing that really sort of number me was uh, getting the, the visa and the permanent residence was pretty complicated uh, because of, there was many numerous work visa options and requirements in Australia. Um, um, and, and I guess not many of you are thinking about getting a visa. So I'll just summarize here to say that uh, getting a visa is pretty complicated. Uh, and, and I suppose my advice is just to, if, if you're really thinking about working in, in, in another country is to explore all the visa options uh, and, and to weigh out the costs and benefits. Uh, I, I could say that my, the, uh, it was quite costly for me to apply for a visa. And one of the things that I was quite unhappy about is that uh, the university does not pay for my visa applications. Uh, so I rem remember the, the, the total cost of my visa application was close to about 5,000 US dollars for me and my family. Uh, and I went through a two-stage visa process. First, I have to apply for a temporary uh, work visa, uh, but it will only give you about four years. Uh, but if you want to stay longer after that, then you have to apply for permanent residence. So, so I applied for two times and each time it cost quite a bit. Uh, and then later I found out that actually if uh, there's another option here, uh, there's also a, what we call a general skill migration. Uh, that means to say you apply for a, a, a permanent residence before you even get the job. Uh, so Australia has these options and I believe some other countries have the option as well. Uh, so the advantage of that is, you know, just apply for one, once you get a permanent residence, then you get to get a job. So it's sort of the reverse, I, I sort of get the job first, then I apply for a permanent residence. Uh, so just to sum it up, there, there are many different options that you should try to explore them uh, and weigh out the cost benefits uh, uh, because it, it might turn out cheaper in, in one or the other options. Uh, so I guess my, my advice is to, if you are really serious about working in another country, find out what are the, all the visa options and do your research early uh, rather than learn from them later on. Uh, and, and I say, you know, without all the costs uh, of applying for visa and there's also tax, um, you know, rebates and stuff like that. Uh, and, and you might want to employ the service of a migration agent just to help you. I, I didn't do that. And, and I, I guess I pay a huge cost later on. And on, on hindsight, it will probably make life, my life much easier if I have a migration agent to help me in that process. Uh, just to sum up, I guess my next advice is just to talk about um, uh, so if you're interested in living in different uh, uh, international communities, uh, it's just to meet and network with uh, science education communities through different regional international conferences. Uh, so I guess most of you here are in NAS and, uh, and NAS is a good place if, if you're thinking of studying or working in the North America, uh, but I'll just mention a few others, uh, sort of more region uh, uh, conferences. I think Isara, as the first speaker has talked about, is also another fantastic place. Uh, and if you're serious in thinking about living or studying in Europe, you have to attend Isara. Uh, and in, in Australia, uh, if you're keen to come here, uh, we have this uh, ASERA conferences, which held once a year. And this year was actually held in Perth, organized by Curtin. Uh, and next year, I think we'll be going to Queensland. So if you're, think, if you're thinking of coming uh, down under, that you might want to attend one of these conferences. I guess what I want to say is that, you know, all these different conferences have Although, although we are all looking at science education, that's the common topic, but regionally speaking, uh, each community has a different culture, a different emphasis, 
and of course different people uh, and by meeting those people you know you, you might want to find out more about uh, the, the the culture or, or the work environment in, in those countries before you make the big move uh, and also from there you can also network with some of the key uh, researchers who might be uh, helpful in, in your move to uh, to Australia or any other places that you, you are thinking of going. Uh, in South America and Middle East, I'm sure they have pretty good science education conferences, but it's just that I do not know who they are, so, what they are, so I leave it blank. But I, I suppose, you know, I, um, I'll leave you to find out uh, more about, you know, those conferences and the places that you wanted to go. Okay, so I guess I'll just end here. That's sort of uh, my brief sort of sharing with you about my experience in Australia. All right, thank you, everyone. Okay, so thank you very much. This was like for the three presenters. I think this, this is probably a common thought for everyone. I was I just found them so interesting. Like, sir, how different can be the backgrounds and the context, and then like how everyone takes a decision to do like to move uh, abroad. Um, I don't know, like if we have um, any questions or comments that someone would like to do. Yes, Mercy, go ahead. We cannot hear you, you're muted. Okay, now uh, I just want to appreciate uh, the three speakers because uh, they spoke from different angles. Uh, talking about the first speaker who spoke like a student and the hurdles she had to go to, that was really emotional and touching, you know? Uh, going abroad, how she had to, from, from her background, parents not going to school. And one thing that she emphasized that I really like is asking questions. At whatever stage you get as an international student or you're working abroad, try to ask questions. What you don't know, just ask. And people will be there. And she said, even when you're not getting, still, still insist. When they are saying a no, still insist, ask somebody else. I think this, this is quite good. And for professors and other teach, others teaching abroad, well, this is quite, a, I'm, I'm happy we have over 20 or like 24 participants. And I know quite a number of NAST members are watching this, just to know how to move, how to watch a, a walk abroad. What are the challenges? What are the merits? Where can we walk? So we thank you all the three uh, speakers and thank you organizers for these beautiful things you have put together. I think we have all learned from it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mercy, for the kind words. Uh, I actually, uh, this is what we wanted to achieve. We wanted to share some um, personal stories, not just uh, guidelines that you can find in a, on a book. So the, I think uh, you provided some uh, very useful information today. Um, and uh, the authenticity, uh, it, it's what uh, characterized this presentation today. Thank you very much to the speakers. I pasted on the chat box um, the email addresses of the three speakers, if you want to reach out to them. And if you have any other questions that you can, that you would like to ask the speakers now, go ahead. We have four minutes left, I think. Also, I would say that uh, if you have like any increase or uh, I know like experiences you would like to share, because this was planned, like I said, virtual, like this is a series, right? 
So we had a previous one event on something, and this one is in something else, and we will have a third one, and hopefully we will have more. So I mean, we are the international committee. We are trying to make NARS open to the world, not just maybe only the US, which it's normally like most people would relate it to. So if you uh, have either like any suggestions, any comments, any experience you would like to share, please go ahead, contact any NARS member here from the international committee you can check in the website and um, yes feel free for to leave us any comment or anything that we might find the way Everyone's pretty shy. Um, can I try? Can I try to summarize? Because it seemed like uh, there are some three really good ideas from what I took from it. One is that it, you just have to sometimes take a risk. Um, all, all, all three of the speakers took some kind of risks in some sense. You know, whether it's moving with um, without have, having an, a, a migration agent and and without having worked in the place before, but just go, going for it or um, whether it's cold call, cold call emails, um, or, or or reaching out to people that that you don't know how they're going to respond, and just trying to find out what, what's there. So I feel like taking a risk, um, asking lots of questions, seem to be a good theme. You know, just making connections with people and seeing who who can get back to you and what 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 resources they can share um, through those connections that you can you can make, um, and uh, and then. Again, with connections, you know, what's what's going to motivate you to kind of try to find that like some kind of inspiration in terms of you know you want you want new opportunities, you want a new place, or you um, you know there seems to be some kind of a theme there among the speakers as well. So very interesting. Okay, well, we're winding down around the time. I will I'll stop the recording. Okay, thank you.